Reading with your kids. Hola, Niha, Kenichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are so very happy that you are part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. We hope that you subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. We have a fantastic guest for you today. He is here to celebrate his debut middle grade novel, A Small Zombie Problem. Today we meet K.G. Campbell. Before we invite KG in to tell us about this small zombie problem, or is it a problem with the small zombie? I, I, I'm not sure. He'll explain. But before he comes in to explain all of that, we want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is brought to you by I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright. If you're around kids these days, you may have noticed that many of them don't realize how very capable they are. Many children haven't had practice solving their own problems, and therefore they think that they're not just not able to. Kids need to know that they are quite capable of handling situations they encounter in everyday life and capable of handling the emotions that come with those situations as well. Practice handling their problems is essential for achieving excess in the real world. Problems such as, as missing shoes and having to turn off the TV, wanting a pet, or, or making a mistake – and they certainly need practice solving small zombie problems. Well, kids learn best through repetition. And after reading this book and hearing the mantra, I can handle it, over and over and over, they will, will identify with the child in the story, realize that they are just like him, and declare to all that they can handle it. Check it out today. You can learn more about I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright by going to lauriewriter.com. And also, you can find I Can Handle It on Amazon. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by our friends at Familius Publishing. We love Familius Publishing. They're the publishing company that brought you Dr. John DeGarmo's a little book of foster care wisdom. They also brought you Brad Berger's big book of family games. And they also brought you the brand new take on Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken that was illustrated by our friend Vivian Miniker. Well, Familius is a global trade publishing company that publishes books and other content to help families be happy. Familius believes that family is a fundamental unit of society and that happy families are the foundation of a happy life. Familius recognizes that every family looks different, and Familius passionately believes in helping all families find greater joy. To that end, Familius published books for children and adults that invites families to live the Familius Nine Habits of Happy Family Life. Love together, play together, learn together, work together, talk together, heal together, read together, eat together, and laugh together. Check them out at Familius.com and be sure to follow them at Familius Talk on Instagram to learn more about all of their great titles and to stay up to date on their latest releases. And last but not least, before KG comes in to tell us about his small zombie problem, we want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by the Superhero School Series by Donna Sager Cowan. Cat the Cat wants a home, a family and friends she can count on when suddenly she finds herself in Sweet Meadows. Now that's a long way from the alley she calls home. Cat discovers that she can talk, but she can't decide if she's dreaming or dead. Simon is a mouse, and he's having the worst day ever. Instead of celebrating his first day at superhero school, he's on the breakfast menu. Twice, a hawk considered him an easy meal, but quick thinking changed that. Now, a cat wants to pound, but not if Simon can help him. With a quick plan and a matchstick, Simon speeds towards certain death. Will he arrive at superhero school? Join the entire superhero school gang for their first adventure with the courage of a mouse. The Superhero School Series, book one, a middle grade chapter book for ages 7 to 12, focusing on courage, friendship, and finding the superhero inside all of us. The series touches on common life themes and challenges with humor, patience, and self-improvement techniques. 
with the courage of a mouse, the Superhero School Series, book one by Donna Sager Cohen. Joining us on the line right now from right outside of Los Angeles and California. We're really excited he's here to celebrate his debut middle grade novel. Please welcome to the show, author and illustrator K.G. Campbell. K.G., how are you? I'm good, thanks, Chad. How are you? I am very, very happy that you're on the show. I'm delighted that our equipment seems to be working fine now. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty, and KG is uh, being very patient with me. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about your new debut, uh, your new middle grade novel, A Small Zombie Problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to tell you about it. It's uh, really fun to have published my first novel. It, 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 it's a really fun book. I was uh, telling uh, KG before we started the interview that I started reading the book. We're, I'm overwhelmed by every time I go out to the post office box, the, uh, the, 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 the post office employees just sneer at me because there's a mountain of books that they have to give me. Uh, but yours, <laughs> yours really caught my eye. The uh, artwork on the front is just delightful, and uh, so I opened it up and I started reading it, and I just fell in love with the story and was uh, so happy for so many reasons uh, about this novel. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Um, sure. So uh, ostensibly it is a story about uh, a boy who, through circumstances, finds himself um, isolated in a crumbling mansion with his with his aunt, who is something of an agoraphobic. Uh, and we learn early on that August Dupont, which is his, the character's name, um, is 11 years old and has never left his house. Um, he has been exposed to um, a TV show that he watches um, in a houseboat out of his bedroom window um, called Stella Stars in her own life. Um, and it has introduced him to a whole new world of um, social interaction that he didn't really know existed. And he yearns to have this life. He yearns to have friends. Um, uh, and he wants to join the world and star in his own life, as Stella does in the show. Um, and along the way, he does eventually leave the house and the plot takes him into the real world. Uh, and along the way, he acquires a small zombie, um, which becomes very attached to him and becomes a major obstacle to his goal, which is to make friends. And that is why it's called the small zombie problem, in that it is a problem uh, and the zombie is small. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was telling KG, I was delighted to find out that his uh, main character has shares the name of my beautiful Augie the Wonder Dog here. <laughs> and so that was something that, that made me get my I, – I laughed out loud at the kitchen table during breakfast one morning. My wife was like, what is wrong with you? And I said, no, this, is, this is hilarious. And it, it really is the, um, the, the, the characters, the, the setup, the, the old creaky house that was built on a, um, uh, you know, the fortune that was built on hot sauce. I think that was just, <laughs> just amazing. Yeah. Um, the, the setting is technically fictional. Um, for middle grade, they don't like us to place it to, uh, specifically because, the demographic doesn't have the experience necessarily to understand um, some of the sort of regional specifics that one might use. But to any adult who's ever been there, it's going to be pretty clear that it's set in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, even though I don't use the words bayou and levee, uh, you can tell from the environment that it, that it has a very uh, distinct atmosphere. So what was it that inspired you to create a small zombie problem? Uh, it comes from two different branches. Um, the plot itself, uh, I think, probably extends from me. Well, actually, they both probably have the same root. Um, I was an only child, uh, and two people that are very close to me um, would share stories about their childhood, a brother and a sister. Um, and the dynamic between the two of them always interested me because I didn't have that. And the sister was a little bit older, and she went through a phase of fit, wanting to fit in. You know, she was a tween, a young teenager, um, and she was trying to, you know, a bit of a bad girl. Um, and she had this younger brother who was 
two, three years younger than her. And he was a little awkward and a little chubby and not really fitting in. And he used to follow her around. And while her friends were very nice to him, she couldn't stand it. She hated her brother following him. And there was one incident in particular um, where she locked herself in her bedroom. He was banging on the door thought she'd get away with from him and she climbed out the window and who should be waiting for her at the bottom but her brother. And my mind started working and I think somewhere in the story she called him a zombie. She said, you're such a zombie, whatever. Uh, and I began to think, well, what if I took that scenario and it wasn't a sibling that was the obstacle to the protagonist's goal, what it was an actual zombie. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where the plot began. It was it was a, a way of talking about a child trying to fit into their social group, but having the obstacle of a zombie hanging around them. Mm -hmm. um, and the second branch, also coming from a, from a, an only childhood, was that I was quite a lonely child. Um, and I wanted to... The theme of the book, even though the, the surface um, storyline is about zombies, that's that's the hook that's going to grab the demographic. What the underlying theme and the heart of the story is, is about childhood loneliness. Um, and August Dupont, the, the main character, uh, suffers crushing loneliness as a result of his situational, uh, situational circumstances. So, That's a really powerful thought that, 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 that so many kids are suffering from loneliness for a, a bunch of different reasons. Obviously, you know, kids who are grow up in, in, in a crumbling mansion would never get outside. They're <laughs> obviously lonely. But, but there, there, there's a loneliness that an only child feels, and then there's the loneliness that a child feels when they're being excluded at school. And I, I think it's such an important um, feeling and emotion that kids can really relate to, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm, probably, I'm not sure if all kids can, but uh, certainly some of them can. Um, and, you know, in creating the character, I thought it would be nice to, it'd be nice for other lonely kids to see a kid like them because uh, one thing that can make loneliness feel a little bit less lonely is seeing someone just like yourself, even a fictional someone um, like August. Did that experience of you kind of growing up as an only child, being lonely, is that something that kind of pushed you towards the arts and being becoming an illustrator and a writer? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, this is not a, a unique story by any means. I'm sure you've heard many other authors say it, but um, reading for me was a complete lifeline between the age of, specifically between the ages, ages of maybe 8 to 16, roughly, for that eight years. Um, I don't know how I would have survived without it. I mean, all of the characters in the books I read were my friends, and I was never happier than I was sort of secreted in some blanket fort with my dog and some potato chips and a good book. And um, I think it was my connection with reading at that time that really led me to pursue it, uh, to pursue writing as, as an adult later in life. Yeah. Now, we mentioned earlier that this is your debut middle grade book. You've, you've authored and also illustrated a number of, of picture books. Uh, what, what was it that inspired you to, to make the shift into uh, middle grade books? And how was that different? Was it, was it more fun? Was it challenging? Is it like, I did this, I'm never going to do this again? <laughs> um, well, to be perfectly honest with you, middle grade has always been my, my destination. Um, I got into this industry, um, like many others, uh, over a long period of time struggling to become, uh, to get published, basically. And, uh, you know, I spent several years, I'm sure, with my manuscripts manuscript sitting in the slush piles in the various publishers across New York. Um, and I finally got a toe in the door when I changed tactic and I began to present myself as an illustrator because I'd always been able to draw as well. Um, I realized that was probably a slightly less competitive field. Uh, not that there's not a lot of talented illustrators. There are. But uh, there's a lot less people that think they can illustrate than think they can write. <laughs> so um, – 
from the publisher's point of view, there's less, certainly less portfolios to go through than there are manuscripts. Uh, anyway, so uh, it, it paid off. Um, I, I got into the, in, into the industry as an illustrator. And as an illustrator, you're probably going to wind up in the picture book world because that's where most of us are operating. Uh, and that's where I started. Um, but as I say, I had always intended to get to middle grade. And, um, you know, the first few years of my career, I signed some contracts. I got some gigs. Um, and I was, I was pretty much tied up with that. Um, but I always had the middle grade stuff going on in the background. And, uh, now I'm here and no, it's not something I'm never going to do again. I already have like my next two or three projects lined up. Um, no one's bothered me yet, but, um, I, I know what I want to do after this. What is it about this age group that, um, so interests you? Um, two things. One, I think is, it was at this age that reading was had the most impact on me. Uh, uh, most of my favorite books are middle grade books. Um, and secondly, my skill set is well well suited to it. I mean, I can write and I can draw, which is fine for it's great for picture books. But uh, my aesthetic is a little bit dark for picture books. I mean, my primary influences are Edward Gorey, Tim Burton, um, Alan Guyman, uh, Lemony Snicket. Uh, so that is just, I'm well suited for this, for this demographic. Yeah. You mentioned you, a, a, a little dark in, 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 in a fun way. And, uh, that's something that, um, kids do seem to really kind of get drawn to that, the kind of dark aspects of life. Why do you, why do you think that is? I think at this age, probably what's going on is that they're beginning to become aware of mortality. Um, it, and yet it doesn't frighten them yet. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I'm not a child psychologist, but definitely there is there is a fascination in, with most kids of that age with with the macabre. And um but and yet they seem to find humor in it. Um, so that's what I hope I'm appealing to with with my word. Yeah, th- that dark humor is something that I uh, I love. It drives my wife crazy sometimes because I, <laughs> I I find humor in some very inappropriate places. <laughs> but, <laughs> One thing that you and I were speaking about before we started the interview was uh, as an author and illustrator, um, you know, you have that uh, situation that, that not a lot, a lot of authors have. You have this uh, ability to illustrate your own picture books, and that gives you a, a, a certain sense of, of freedom. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I mean, look, it's just a, it's a simple case of, of power rush. Um, when, I'm illust- when I'm illustrating somebody else's work, um, as we talked about before, uh, you know, we, the illustrator and the author usually don't have much to do with each other. Um, it's, it's really the art director at the publisher who dictates what the, the illustrator is providing. Um, and so there's always some to, someone to answer to. There's the editor, there's the, there's the art director. In some cases, if you have a big celebrity author, the author might be involved as well. Um, when I'm illustrating my own work, uh, apart from some technical aspects that the, the editor might get involved with, what's appropriate for the demographic, what how I'm expressing something, what they want to see in the image. Other than that, I pretty much have full autonomy. And, um, well, I mean, who doesn't like that? <laughs> it's like I get to essentially dictate everything that you see and feel, mm-hmm. um, both in terms of, of word and image. So, uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, absolutely that being able to have that power and, you know, m- you know, and that kind of responsibility, it's like, yeah, this is me. We, we have an editor here and, and, you know, someone's kind of guiding me along. But this 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 is it. This is a breaker. You know, if it if it if it works, it's, uh, you know, in, in a big way because of me. And if it's and if it fails, it's on me, too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what was uh, of your and, and I. I, I can't ask you what your favorite picture book is, but which, if, if someone only had time to check out one of your earlier picture books, which one would you suggest that they check out? Uh, um, I think, 
I think the one that is most me is actually the very first one. It's Lester's Dreadful Sweaters. And I think probably that's what I'm best known for other than Flora and Ulysses. Uh, it's a little bit dark, but just in a, in a very cute way. Um, and like so many other stories, it comes from a very personal place. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's based on an actual event in my own life and, and characters in my own life. And I think that gives it a certain authenticity. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's the one. Did, were you forced to wear dreadful sweaters as, as a youth? <laughs> Not exactly, but, um, the cousin Clara, who is, who is the antagonist in the story, um, is based on my own great aunt. Um, and while she didn't knit me terrible sweaters, she gave the most horrible, horrible gifts. <laughs> and, um, I, what that story is about, the heart of that story is about a five or six year old child learning to pretend to like a gift to preserve the feelings of the gift giver, oh. uh, having to say thank you for something that you don't actually like or want. And I think that's quite a, a sophisticated emotional development uh, that happens fairly early on, at least with empathetic people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might take some kids longer than others, but that's what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things uh, that, that you asked me, you said, what, what, what might you be asking me in, in this conversation? And uh, I, as I explained to you and as the people who listen to the show know, I, I don't really work with the script and we just kind of go wherever the conversation <laughs> takes us. But I always do I, I always do love to ask an author, what kind of conversations do you think families can have when they're sitting down and talking about a small zombie problem? Uh, they can talk, but it's got numerous things. Family secrets abound. Um, so honesty is one thing. Um, what's appropriate for a child to know, um, is another. Uh, but as I said, probably the, the main underlying theme is loneliness. Um, and even if your kid's not lonely, they may know someone who's lonely. And I think ta- understanding, empathizing with people who, have difficulty socializing um, is important. It's an important thing to learn. Learning that some people need alone time, some people crave alone time, but alone time is different than being lonely. Mm-hmm. Um, loneliness, by its very definition, is a negative state. And uh, I think it's important to realize that some people live this isolated existence, even when they're surrounded by other people. Yeah. The, you, you just pointed out something that's, I think, really important, and I don't think uh, I, I don't think a lot of adults really understand the difference too. That alone time is different than being lonely. And Absolutely, yeah. Look, I mean, I I am um, uh, <laughs> I've just I've just lost the word. Um, not antisocial. Uh, I'm an introvert. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and these days, you know, we're encouraged to embrace who we are. We celebrate our individualism. And I no longer see uh, introversion as necessarily a negative thing. It's mm-hmm. part of who I am, and I'm, I'm, I own it. Um, and alone time is really important to introverts. I mean, we definitely need to get away and have that time. But it's very different than being lonely. Lonely is craving um, companionship uh, and not being able to achieve it. That's a completely different state. Um, and that's, yeah, you're right. They're two very different things. Yeah, they are. And I think that, that this, I, I think, would be a really powerful conversation for families to have to not only kind of uh, help kids understand the difference of it and, and also kind of encourage kids to just find the value in taking time to, you know, be alone sometimes with your thoughts and and especially these days when the kids are bombarded with screens you know just to remind them that's really important to shut those things off and allow yourself to breathe sometime allow your mind to breathe but yeah. also uh talking to helping kids who aren't lonely understand just how painful it can be and to really encourage them to to find the courage to to reach out to those kids who are lonely and and offer their friendships. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes those lonely kids just can't, at certain times, can't make those connections. But it, I think it's important for us to encourage our kids to reach out to them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
I agree. Is is there? Uh, I know you mentioned that you have a couple of projects. Is there something uh, that that you're working on that you can give us a little sneak preview of or a little taste of? Well, this is a trilogy. Um, so I'm currently uh, finishing up the manuscript for the sequel, um, and I've got a rough plot for for the final um, installment. Uh, so that's that's going to tie me up for the next few years. Um, but beyond that, uh, still in the middle grade realm, uh, still in fantasy. Uh, fan- I, a couple of them are what I, a word I, I've invented myself. I believe I've invented it. Someone else might have thought of it. Fantastorical. Um, okay. We're talking sort of Game of Thrones for middle grade, uh-huh. uh, sort of based in history, but with a lot of fantasy in it. Um, so that's that's the kind of thing that you can look forward to. Dragons, maybe. Mm, I love dragons. <laughs> Well, one of the things, too, I want, before we go, I just want to make sure, um, I, I, I love taking this opportunity anytime I've, I've, I'm speaking to somebody who was involved in a, a graphic novel or a comic, and you, I think you, you were saying the first middle grade project that you were involved with was a graphic novel. Can you just kind of, I, I like to, to re- use these opportunities to remind parents because it's something that I didn't realize at the time when my son was, in middle grades and high school, and he was really into graphic novels. Help, help parents remember that reading graphic novels, reading comics, it's reading and it's valuable, and there there are real stories in those books. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be fair, Flora and Ulysses is a, a, a novel graphic novel hybrid. Okay. Um, so passages of it are told with cartoon strips, but not the whole book. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely. Reading is reading, whether it's a graphic novel or even comic books. I mean, it's still a form of storytelling, um, which is just as powerful. Uh, and, you know, if you can get your kids into a book, I'd say do it however you can. Mm-hmm. Um, Abs- so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what, where can folks go to connect with you online and find out all the different projects you've been involved with and be able to keep up to date with what's, what's coming from you in the future? Uh, I have a website, www.kgcampbell.com. Um, you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, you can follow me on Insta, uh, Twitter. Um, just you know, look for KG Campbell. You'll find me there. Awesome. Uh, Amazon, uh, you can look at my author page. All the links are in there. So, Fantastic. Yeah. It's, I, I love that we're living in a time where there's we, we've so many ways to connect with uh, people who inspire us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although it's a, lot, it's a lot of work filling up all that social media. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> we've been talking today to the author of, uh, of the wonderful, and it really is a wonderful, fun novel, a middle grade novel, A Small Zombie Problem, K.G. Campbell. K.G., thank you so much for being part of our show today. Thank you, Jen. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be our friend Jennifer Swanson here for another great STEM Tuesday edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Hey, we want to thank the folks who made today's show so very, very wonderful. We want to thank our guest, K.G. Campbell. Be sure you check out A Small Zombie Problem. We also want to thank our sponsors. We want to thank our friend Donna Sager Cowan. Make sure you check out the Superhero School series. We want to thank Laurie Wright. Check out lauriewriter.com, especially if you are an author. There's also some great stuff there for authors. And, of course, we want to thank all of our friends at Familius Publishing. We want you to uh, follow them on Instagram. They have a great Instagram, and you can find out all about all of their great titles and also find out about the new titles that are coming out. So make sure you follow Familius Talk on Instagram. I want to thank my amazing producer, Fatima Khan, for all she does. Make sure you check out her blog on the readingwithyourkids.com website. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all of the support that she gives me. And I want to thank you. You are the reason we, well, you are the reason we're doing this. But we're really doing this podcast for you kids. So that you can grow closer to your kids by taking time every day and reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.